Hi everyone, I'm Natalie Kelly. I'm a low vision orthoptist based in Melbourne and uh, Glaucoma Australia has invited me to present on low vision and rehabilitation for those with glaucomatous loss. Uh, this presentation has been adapted from a presentation given uh, for glaucoma awareness as part of the vision initiative. So thank you to everyone that's um, listening today. As we know, vision loss from glaucoma can be preventable. However, in some cases, people do experience vision loss. So today I'm going to cover a few areas to help you understand how vision objectively changes in glaucoma and how a person uh, with glaucoma perceives their vision loss. This may grant us some insight into why this condition is a sneaky blindness and also how profession professionals can guide people with vision loss to seek help if there's any change in quality of life or function. This presentation is also aimed for those that have glaucoma and also for family members and caregivers of those supporting people with um, glaucoma vision loss. Uh, I will discuss how low vision rehabilitation can help someone with vision loss and how you can refer to low vision services. And finally, I provide some actions for you to consider when supporting um, someone with vision loss. So vision loss from glaucoma can impact quality of life because it affects different aspects of vision to varying degrees. So I've separated the visual changes into visual function and the associated impact on function. However, please take note that the visual functions identified on the left side of the table are all intertwined. And this is why we see variability in visual performance. Reduced detail vision and visual field loss are more predominantly impacted by glaucoma. Many people with glaucoma um, experience subtle changes in their vision, uh, especially detail vision. And this is because a large part of the optic nerve um, it, it, that's affected by glaucoma is made up of nerves that support our detail vision. When detail vision is affected, it can create difficulties with reading small print, including reading uh, expiry date on medication. And this can be a barrier to independent management of your eye condition. Detail vision loss may also impact our ability to drive safely because it can impede our ability to read um, road and traffic signs when driving. Visual field loss is commonly affected in glaucoma, but it's not easily perceived. And I'll talk a bit more about this later. Reduced visual field impacts on self-confidence when mobilising in the community. There may also be an increased incidence of bumping into objects or tripping on obstacles. Uh, this increases our risk of falls. So field loss, excuse me, my slides are being broke. So field loss um, can also impact our ability to efficiently locate objects and may reduce our confidence when walking or driving. Contrast sensitivity is how faded something becomes before it disappears. We access our contrast vision for various activities of daily living, including recognising faces, preparing meals and completing general household activities, such as vacuuming or dusting. So if central vision is impacted, then we need to be mindful um, uh, of our colour vision as this may also be reduced. So if this is the case, visual search um, and meal preparation may be harder or slower to complete. Reduced depth perception from loss can result in difficulty with mobility, increased risk of falls and also hesitation going downstairs. Another important factor to consider is difficulty seeing in dim or dark environments. So when we lose our peripheral or our side vision, this area is the area that we predominantly use for um, navigating dim and dark environments. So when we lose that side vision, we need more light to function. So when there is a reduction, um, excuse me again, when there is a reduction, um, this may manifest in terms of you moving more cautiously through an environment and generally having difficulties seeing um, in low lighting conditions. There may also be complaints that the light is just not strong enough either. So as you can see, there are various implications and impact on function when there is glaucomatous loss. 
So glaucoma is commonly considered a sneaky blindness. So why is it so hard for someone to notice that their vision has changed um, when there's so many aspects of vision that is affected? Uh, a very important case study by Crabbe and colleagues can help us answer this question. So a group of um, a group of researchers investigated how people with glaucoma loss perceived their vision. So participants in this study had varying degrees of vision loss from glaucoma, and they were shown different simulations um, of vision loss presented on the slide. So they asked to identify the image that best represents their um, perception of their field loss. So commonly, glaucomatous vision loss is marketed as the black tunnel of vision that you see here. But interestingly, no participant actually indicated um, that black parts were missing. Um, participants with mild or moderate vision loss reported images to be blurred or missing um, and did not, uh, and some didn't even notice that they had vision loss. And for those with severe vision loss, they reported bits that were actually just missing. So why, um, why is the perception of vision loss important in low vision rehabilitation? Because many people with vision loss don't actually notice that they have vision loss. There is a subtle and unconscious um, change and this is because our brain is able to adapt to the slow regression of vision by trying to fill in parts of vision that are missing. However, this fill-in effect risks our safety and may impact on quality of life because it can increase frustrations without really being clear as to what's happening. So difficulty to perform common activities of daily living caused by vision loss may manifest in language such as I have difficulty focusing or a family member might notice that there's a change in the way that um, the person with uh, vision loss actually completes an activity that they've been used to uh, doing efficiently, such as um, such as having to turn on all the lights when preparing a meal. And these changes are slow and subtle in accordance with the vision loss. So this is why family and friends and supports play a really important role in identifying changes in vision loss from glaucoma because they are familiar with the person that has vision loss and they're able to see and hear these functional changes. So as red flags, we can listen to signs in language and researchers found that the most common language used around vision loss in glaucoma is when people report things to be missing, they report things to be blurred or unfocused, some also report double vision, um, uh, vision to disappear or there's blank parts of the vision, it's unclear, fuzzy or foggy. So these are important terms to consider when talking about, when, when listening to someone that's experiencing vision loss. So other red flags that we can be mindful of are when there's changes in function. So this is when things become harder to do that were previously easier to, to, um, to do. So observing and, uh, observing and noticing change may be when um, the person with vision loss reports difficulty reading or they need more light to be able to see when reading, um, whether or not there's new or more frequent bruises from bumping into objects or you see their confidence change when they're moving through environments or completing certain activities of daily living. They might show hesitation when moving through crowded environments when previously they were a bit more confident. Um, they, may, they may appear a bit more nervous, excuse me, um, when faced with stairs or you see them holding on to stairs a little bit tighter to that handrail when walking down the, 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 the stairs. So if you notice or... Um, if you're noticing that you're listening to the TV a little bit more than watching the screen, all of these are signs that vision might have changed. So these are just some examples that um, might indicate different signs and observations that might indicate changes in vision. So if you have glaucoma and you're noticing signs or if you are, if your loved one um, and you can, uh, you can hear or see changes in function um, for your loved one with glaucoma, there's some steps that you should take. One is 
to return back to the optometrist or the ophthalmologist for a review um, to make sure that there is no change or if there is a change that that could be addressed um, sooner rather than later. And two, when there is change in function, consider seeking low vision supports. So even if the vision is stable but function is changing, um, this is where low vision supports can, um, can make life a little bit easier. So timely access to low vision supports will help mitigate the impact of vision loss. It's important to note that low vision services um, can be done concurrently with optometrists and ophthalmologist support. Uh, there are many options for help, so the referral pathway is open for anyone to refer. So um, you can refer your family member, can refer um, the doctor or even an allied health professional can refer to low vision services. So both Guide Dogs and Vision Australia um, are very common non-for-profit organisations um, that uh, are uh, are commonly known in the community that provide low vision supports, but there are actually private um, uh, low vision practices that are also available uh, to provide help. And one thing to note is that private low vision practices uh, usually offer a different um, type of service to the non-for-profit um, support agencies. So Southern Low Vision and Vision Matters and also Southern Cross Vision Services are orthoptic services across Vision um, uh, Victoria and uh, New South Wales. And then Eye Care Explorer Independent Pathways are orientation and mobility supports that can, um, services that can be offered. So I guess what this slide is showing you is that there is um, options available and um, it's best to explore your your options to see what what fits best for your needs and having your needs addressed. So orientation and mobility is a very important to help improve safe mobility and increase confidence in the community. Orientation and mobility specialists can help people develop skills needed to improve um, to move safely and confidently in their environment and also explore various navigational apps on their iPad um, and, uh, and their mobile phone for independent travel. They can, um, orientation and mobility specialists can be in contact with local councils to implement um, uh, and, and advocate for more accessible options for mobility, such as implementing tactile markers at road crossings or putting um, road crossings in to help safe mobility in the community. So general low vision services out, uh, outlined on this slide are often um, offered uh, by both non-for-profit and private um, practices and these um, services on this slide are specifically orthoptic um, services and they include education about vision loss and implications of visual performance. This will be individualised um, for the, the person. Comprehensive vision functions are so looking at what parts of the vision works best and um, what parts are missing and how to, to optimise vision, looking at magnification and assistive technology strategies to, again, help with reading and writing tasks and near tasks, management of visual fatigue, visual crowding, lighting, glare sensitivity and sensor integration um, uh, strategies as well. So not all low vision services are the same. So specialist uh, vision rehabilitation uh, services commonly seen in private practices can focus on optimising visual systems in those with vision loss. So some strategies can be complementary to magnify or speech technology, whilst other strategies may um, be able to improve uh, functional vision without the need of assistive technology. So in my practice, I offer specialist uh, vision intervention that looks at optimising the visual system. So one strategy that I offer um, looks at stabilising fixation or the ability to focus on something. 
So fixation instability is when the eyes move around in an attempt to see better. So with this, with the images on the left, these bluey green dots that you can see on the top image is all the points that the person is trying to stabilise the eyes and look straight. So um, through a program that I provide using biofeedback technology, we can actually stabilise the vision. And when we stabilise the eye movements, we actually can improve detail vision and contrast as well. Eccentric viewing is another strategy that can be employed to help someone utilise a different part of the retina to enable better vision. We can look at visual field awareness and also scanning training and improving binocular functions um, will also help with those that experience eye strain, visual associated headaches and also double vision as well. So funding options are very varied and also dependent on whether or not you're looking at a non-for-profit or a private practice. Um, Medicare is something that is offered by optometrists and that, um, and that you can get your consult either fully billed or partly billed through Medicare. Um, in relation to my aged care, my aged care is predominantly offered through the non-for-profit sector. NDIS, the Department of Veterans Affairs, these are both offered through both private and the non-for-profit sector. And then you have um, part funding available through your private health insurance. And this is only offered um, via private um, practices. So some simple strategies to consider is regular eye checks. So using um, uh, so making sure that you're keeping on top of your regular eye checks. So using uh, large print calendars and putting your appointment reminders in. Um, family and friends should also have a conversation about seeing the optometrist or an ophthalmologist if they're noticing any red flags in their language or their function. Um, and... Uh, uh, with uh, eye drops, make sure that you set alarms. So eye drops is the first point um, of point of call to make sure that we manage the glaucoma and the pressures. So things um, things like setting alarm for reminders, using a magnifier to read expiry dates on drop medication, or also organizing your fridge to store the drops in a visible location as a backup reminder as well. So also getting in touch with a support services such as Glaucoma Australia is really important because they're there to um, be able to, to support you through this process. Um, they're there to answer questions you have um, and also connect you with other people that share, uh, um, that have shared experiences. Also, please refer to low vision services as well. There are a lot of people that could benefit from support but do not know that they either exist or that they're even eligible for support. So if you have difficulty with your vision um, when you're doing just general things like looking at your phone, preparing meals, seeing your meals, um, putting on makeup, these are all indications that low vision services will be helpful. Um, and again, anyone can refer to low vision services. So early intervention is the key to maintaining independence and also quality of life. So I'd like to finish my presentation um, with this incredibly powerful video by Glaucoma Australia and OPSN. This short video depicts vision loss through the eyes of a father with glaucoma watching his son grow. So whilst glaucomatous vision loss is preventable, some do lose vision. And whatever path um, people have with glaucoma, it's important for you to know that um, there are many people and professionals here to help you. Sorry.
So, so I'm just going to answer some questions uh, that we have here on the chat. So please bear with me while I look through this. So are there any safety uh, measurements to take when preparing meals, for example, using brightly coloured cutting knives? Um, so yes, so we want to make sure that we optimise contrast. Uh, so especially if you've got depth perception challenges, um, increased contrast of cutting knives, but also the, um, the chopping boards as well would be really helpful. So using a contrasting chopping board with the actual food that you're cutting. So if you're cutting a tomato, that would be best on a white chopping board rather than a wooden one or if you're cutting um, uh, washed potatoes, for example, you'd want to use maybe a green chopping board. So you, you want to increase the, the contrast of what, of what you're doing. The other thing that's also really important um, with glaucomatous vision loss, because uh, the, visual, the, the visual field is predominantly affected, we want to optimise that central vision. So using um, focal lighting will also help with preparing meals as well. So a comment by Betty. So thank you for sharing um, the early signs. So it is so important to catch it as early as possible or assume you just need glasses. Yes, I, I agree with you. It's really important. So even if um, you make a really good point here, Betty, by, you know, someone saying, oh, maybe I just need glasses, that's also another really um, a clear indication that maybe that there's a change in function as well. So definitely go see the optometrist. But if they're telling you that everything's okay and glasses, um, a change in glasses is not going to help, that's an indication that maybe other functions um, are changing and low vision services would be really important. So, you know, low vision services are essential for early um, intervention. So when there's mild or moderate loss of vision um, in glaucoma, that's actually when you're going to also benefit, not necessarily later stages. Yes, that's going to be huge. But if we put in strategies along the way, um, if there is further vision loss, you've already you've already um, kept on top of it. And so the change um, in the vision is not going to feel so overwhelming because you've already got these um, compensatory strategies that are supporting you through this process. So um, we've got another question here. So is there a person qualified to help with computer screen, computer and screen, uh, screen settings which are low vision friendly, such as a contrast or text size? And how do um, how did those with low vision get such assistance? So assistive technology, it's a good question. So assistive technology consultants are available both through um, Vision Australia and Guide Dogs, but also privately as well. So um, assistive technology consultants uh, specialise in uh, adaptive technology. Um, and from my experience, there's quite a few assistive technology consultants that have low vision. Um, and so they're, they're users of this technology. And I find that um, they, they're, they're really great 
um, because they use the technology, they know all the shortcuts, they know how to use the technology efficiently and um, they've got a lot of insight. So uh, getting in touch with um, with with both uh, Vision Australia or Guide Dogs, but also reaching out to to private um, assistive technology uh, consultants as well. So um, we've got a uh, another message here from Tanika. Um, so my mum has advanced glaucoma and she just had surgery today and with getting a Miracle shunt, um, as has many surgeries, but nothing works with keeping the pressures down. She can't do anything in the dark, but she can trip um, over the smallest things when walking and can't judge stairs. She would be a perfect um, candidate or she would be uh, perfectly suited to low vision services. So low vision services would look to see how much vision she's got um, and remaining and utilising that as well. So that's a combination, um, depending on the severity of her vision loss, could look at um, some, some vision strategies, some visual system strategies, but also looking at uh, sensory integration strategies as well. So just yeah, I think uh, just keeping in mind that when she sees an ophthalmologist, um, they're focused on preserving the, the level of vision that she's got. Um, and so that's why her seeing the ophthalmologist works really nicely and complements low vision services, because within low vision services, we look at function and we look at problems like everyday problems and um, trying to find solutions to support that, increase her independence, increase her confidence, because I can imagine she'd be really quite nervous trying to judge stairs, going into unfamiliar environments, um, especially if she's got a history of trooping. So, you know, she would, I reckon she would benefit from um, low vision services. So do we need a referral to see an orthoptist or who do special um who specializes in low vision uh, in specialist low uh, vision rehabilitation no you don't so you can refer yourself you can refer a family member um but what we would do so for me um anyone can refer to me but one thing that i do ask is uh for an updated eye report either i can seek that from the ophthalmologist um or you or oh, you guys can provide that um and there's two reasons for having a recent um uh, ophthalmology report and that's because we need to meet duty of care to make sure that because your condition um uh, is a condition that can cause this sneaky blindness we want to make sure that you're receiving the best possible care from your ophthalmologist um, and that we want to see also whether or not um, the the vision is stable what treatments you're um, you're taking into consideration so um, and that it's just glaucoma or, if, or, or, or the ophthalmologist also provides you know scans at the back of the eye that that help with the that help uh, us better understand what's happening with the structure and function of um, of the eye which will then lead to you know um, how you would how the vision is also impaired so anyone can refer um, so uh, does fixation stability help with nystagmus caused by early glaucoma? So this is an interesting question because nystagmus can sometimes get confused with fixation instability. So, um, uh, but fixation stability, regardless of whether or not it's nystagmus or fixation instability due to early changes in glaucoma, um, the biofeedback uh, training that I offer, yes, it does. It does help with stabilizing fixation, um, and, and it's fairly successful as well. Uh, is there is there an age uh, criteria for specialist vision rehabilitation, such as eccentric viewing um, training for children? So eccentric viewing training for children. The youngest that I've done eccentric viewing on is an eight-year-old and that's that's gone fairly well 
So it depends on the maturity of the child. So if the child is able to um, attend to instructions and follow instructions and uh, they've got fairly good visual attention and they've got good comprehension, then they should be able to, to do the eccentric viewing training. Um, but there's also, uh, again, I'm a really big believer in early intervention. So there's other strategies that we can look at um, if a child is younger than, than eight, for example, that is, that's struggling with their vision. <laughs> Excuse me. So, yes, um, definitely get in touch with an orthoptist and um, see what strategies uh, would be available. And also have a look to see whether or not your child would be suitable for eccentric viewing training uh, now or in the future. Uh, I think that's so. Um, So now that we've finished up all the questions, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Hopefully you've been able to take some um, valuable information away from this. Hopefully this has opened up your understanding of low vision and how this can potentially help. Um, but yes, I'd really encourage you to, um, to seek low vision supports because there's a lot of people out there that would be able to benefit that um, are just not tapping into it. So thank you again for your time and um, yeah, all the best.